list. I won't. Uh, I won't go through all of them. But there's there's two handouts. One of them is just sort of a a rehash. I'm glad to say on a you know really nice day like this and the way it's been for the last few you know, last week or so. Um, at first, I thought it would be useful to hand out something on heat stress. About a couple of weeks ago, I was getting questions about you know what kind of damage you get from 108 degree weather and. And with global warming talk and everything, I figured maybe this was going to be one of those years where we we're going to have you know 20 days over 105 in uh, July or something. But uh, hopefully we get this kind of weather instead. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on that one, but it's something I put together about four years ago, and it was basically related to heat stress and carbohydrate loading and kind of what damage uh, high temperatures do and really the bottom line part you know from most of the research that's been done in california and other states is that the early season high temperatures like what we had a couple of weeks ago uh, and even if they come in the next week or so you know generally are less damaging uh, than when you have a big bowl load on the plant so when you're really trying to set bowls you're kind of right near peak flowering that's kind of bad timing to have to deal with 110 degree weather, high nighttime temperatures, you have impacts on pollination and so on. Um, so if you have some time, you might take a look at that one. And there, I don't think there's, I, I wish us all cooler weather so we don't have to think about that too much. Um, I, I'll shift in a minute. Well, maybe I'll go ahead. The other handout that's going, should be going around um, is gonna be on uh, Fusarium. Uh, they asked me to talk about it. It's not anybody's favorite subject. Um, you can cut me off if you really have heard enough and don't want to hear anything more on Fusarium. Uh, we can take a vote. If no one wants to hear anything about it, I'll, I'll stop. Well, I don't think Dan said that. I think he had yeah. some, he has it. Well, um, I'll actually, the, the weird thing, at least for me, has been that the, the hot spot for phone, for phone calls and requests for field visits for Fusarium has actually been like this area north this year. Um, so it's sort of old news in western Fresno County, lots of Tulare County, uh, some of the remaining acreage in Kern County. We've been dealing with fusarium, a lot of fusarium calls for a long time. Um, and uh, a few of the things I thought I'd just mention rel relative to fusarium to give you, uh, what I tried to do is put together uh, uh, what I call a grower information summary and again, it's probably more than you want to look at, but if you want to scan it sometimes, what I, I put some things in there about uh, scouting fields. You know, it's obviously, it's, it's, Fusarium is something that will damage the plants through, through the season, but it's still really a seedling disease. So uh, it's the e easiest to scout for it. It's easiest to find it. It's easiest to clearly identify it prior to first bloom. And so we can, you know, certainly if you have any fields you want me to look at, um, or Dan, uh, Brian Marsh in Kern County, um, we can go take a look at fields and we can do it any time of the year that you want. It gets a lot, a lot more confusing uh, at the time of the year that you start seeing verticillium in addition to these areas. So they look actually somewhat similar, you know, when you get into older plants, but earlier in the season, if you see that kind of yellowing in the crotic area on leaves, and you see a lot of uh, plants, especially in kind of a hot spot area like the size of this tent, um, that is a real good chance that that's a fusarium issue. And it's something that we do have with the help of the Cotton Growers Association, a company called Agdea, and uh, Mike Davis and some of his compatriots uh, up at Davis. Uh, worked on and then we've tested, field tested a quick test for Fusarium Race 4. And so that's available. Um, we're still at the point, you know, that we'll, we'll do those type of analyses for free as long as we're involved in them. Uh, it's not quite as user-friendly a test as they might imply when they're getting you to buy it. Um, so when they tell you people it's a good tailgate kind of test, I don't really agree with that because uh, it's too expensive. It's about 35 to 40 bucks a, a piece for the kits. So if you get a negative, then what I always end up doing is, let's see, is it really a negative? Do I need to do a second one? Do I need to do a third one? Um, it's just iffy enough uh, doing it in the field that I still think it's something that you take back to an office, take back to a lab. And, but it is available and it's a, a fairly reliable test. 
uh, only on root tissue. Doesn't work on stem very well, doesn't consistently work on cotyledons, um, and it's much harder to use when you get later in the season. And we, anyway, we can provide those type of services and we do have, uh, have those supplies with us pretty much the year round. Um, the other thing that's kind of of interest uh, to me, at least this year, um, and you probably already know about this, is that we had a real aggressive in field inspection program that uh, the Crop Improvement Association was involved in, in setting up. Um, and what happened really is this is sort of like if you, a lot of you have probably been following what's been happening with race three fusarium and tomatoes and how rapidly that's sort of moved down through the state. And really that's been our experience. We found this first in, you know, I think Dan and Bruce Roberts and several of us found this first in 2001 in cotton. And in a 15 year period, it's in every county that we grow cotton in, in the San Joaquin Valley. And it's very widespread, lots and lots of fields, probably over, I think we're up to over 400 fields that we've identified it in uh, and confirmed it. So it, it spreads easily. Uh, one of the issues was potential for spread in planting seed and one of the things that happened is there's a very aggressive program set up with Crop Improvement Association for field inspections and this thing spread so rapidly that basically about every field, a couple of years ago if you were wondering why you couldn't get Phytogen 802 RF, if there's any Phytogen people here you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, my, to my knowledge, uh, you couldn't get Phytogen 802 RF uh, two years ago because basically all of the seed production fields were canceled uh, because fusarium was found at least in one little spot area in the field and that was enough to cancel it as a seed field. So the industry sort of reassessed this whole thing, put in a recommendation to the Crop Improvement Association basically to really back off on these inspections change their tolerance level or else what you'll end up with is no planting seed. Even if you still do want to plant cotton, you won't be able to get any seed because all the fields will get canceled. So it's it's been a roller coaster, a really rough ride, uh, but it's still one I think to take real seriously. Um, the, the, the main, so there's some things that you can look at in here. Some of them are more uh, related to what you would do if you saw a real early uh, infestation. Uh, in terms of you can kind of cut the rate that this will spread by being pretty aggressive about taking something out of production uh, uh, when, you, when you only see like a little spot. But if by the time you see a, a spot in the field that probably was taken out by fusarium that's maybe the size of a swimming pool or so, that's probably something that's been there for maybe two or three years at least. So all of the operations that have gone through that field have helped spread the spores around. And so by the time you, you tried to say, well, I'm gonna go out there with Roundup and I'm gonna go out there with Bay Pam and I'm gonna do everything I can to blast that area of the field. It's, a, it's not a bad idea, it's not a bad practice, but it won't solve your problem completely because by the time you see something that big, if you did any cross disking, if you moved irrigation water down through the field, you already moved the spores. And the chlamydospores in particular are ones that uh, I'm always sorry to say that they'll, they'll be around a lot longer than I will. Uh, you could probably put asphalt down in a parking lot, leave it for 30 years, come back and plant a resistant, a susceptible variety of cotton 30 years later. Those spores would still be there and the fusarium would get right back up. So it's a survivor kind of disease to be taken seriously. So. And on a less depressing note, <laughs> so I, I usually do a really good job of, of making it sound like, well, you shouldn't grow cotton anymore. Um, but the seed companies in particular have done a, a really good job. Uh, Phytogen in particular has had some really great successes in coming up with resistant cultivars. And so Bayer has some things in the works, Delta Pine and uh, Gib Olvi. So in the Pima front, there's actually a lot of very good news. Uh, multiple cultivars that are commercially available that are Roundup Flex uh, are available from Phytogen. Uh, at least two additional ones from Monsanto Delta Pine. Um, and then Bayer, I think, has, has something kind of in the works that actually looks quite good as well. So nice choices in Pima as long as 
you know, they can get enough planting seed. Um, and uh, in uplands, it's a much more complicated story. We're, we've been involved in a big screening program for uh, probably close to over 10 years uh, with the USDA ARS. And then the seed companies also are, you know, more concerned about this being something that could develop into a national issue. Again, what's really different with this race of fusarium is, is it, it does not have to be associated with root knot nematode. So race one, for it to be damaging, the one that Dick Barber looked at that we've known about in California for, I don't know, what, 70, 80 years or so probably, at least, all, at least back to the 50s, uh, race one fusarium uh, can persist in all kinds of soil types, but it really doesn't do a significant amount of damage unless it's in, in the presence of root knot nematode. So that generally kind of means you're gonna see it in sandy loam, loam soils, but not in these kind of soils. And what's different, unfortunately, with race four is you don't need to have that association to do damage. And so in that way, it's sort of similar to what they've seen with the races of fusarium in lettuce, with the race three, with other races that they have in tomatoes. And again, so it's, it's definitely something to kind of keep in the back of your mind that once you've identified it in the field, then resistant cultivars ought to be on the list of things that you want to consider. And we do have... Uh, information about fusarium you know posted on the uc cotton website um, there are past uh, ratings for all kinds of commercial cultivars we've got about uh, a 2000 plot study that we're doing screening in down in the tipton area and about another thousand plots at another site down in kern county and we get very good participation from the seed companies and putting a lot of their experimentals in there as well as USDA and UC efforts. So, uh, again, if there are any questions on the fusarium ones, we're we're trying to work on it. Uh, like I said, there've been lots of calls up in this area. Um, uh, not everything, you know. And I've talked to Dan about this. I think a couple times in the last year is if you're used to looking at cotton fields and you remember when there were holes in cotton fields for the last hundred years, um, some of those are still holes that have nothing to do with fusarium spots, there's some labiopsis. I looked at a kind of a nasty field up in this area that I think almost everything that I saw was taken out by Rhizoc and uh, and not by Fusarium. We didn't find any Fusarium in that field. So, you know, it isn't something to just sort of panic and assume that everything that you see is Fusarium, which is sort of how I got about four or five years ago. So I'm, I'm recovering somewhat. Um, Anyway, so that's, that's what I have. If there are any questions on Fusarium, um, I did have a couple other things I thought I might mention, but anything on Fusarium? Uh, which varieties did show Fusarium? Pardon me? Which varieties that people have a problem with? What varieties are in the field? Um, well, what uh, it's been, uh, the questions about what varieties, well, up in this area, uh, uh, pretty much any of the up ones. So I've, I've looked at several fields that were Daytona, uh, Phytogen 725, Phytogen 764 WRF. And what it is, is basically the uplands in general, once the inoculum levels get high enough, almost all of the uplands that are commercially grown can be affected by fusarium. And I would say that none of, you know, the way it works with fusarium in, in the cultivars we grow in California, is the most affected, the, the ones that just get wiped out are the most susceptible Pimas. And the best performing ones are the most resistant Pimas. So Pimas at both ends of the spectrums and the, the uplands fill out the whole area in the middle. Everything from, but none of the uplands that we have tested in 15 years, other than maybe a couple of what looks like company experimentals in the last two years, none of them I would have, I would all you know highly resistant nothing and so it stands to reason you get if you grow uh, susceptible varieties and you grow them for enough years you know out of 10 you keep building the inoculum levels and that's why Mike Davis used to use a chart where he would sort of say you know for a long time you, you, you're kind of in the spore production phase with this type of a disease and you build that spore level and all you're going to do in the early stages is you'll take out an occasional plant here and there that just happens to be in the vicinity of a spore 
and it can actually infect the root and take out the plant. Then when you keep increasing the spore population that survives in the soil, then, then there's more and more pressure for more and more plants to get affected. And in general, you know, again, up until the last couple of years, it's been hard to find uplands that would represent anything more than just sort of moderate in terms of resistance. Okay, so that's why you'll see it look fine for years, and then, you know, boom, you'll see a problem. About Hazara? Um, has, all of the Hazaras that we've tested, um, actually, for all the reasons that Dan talked about earlier, they kind of are such a hybrid vigor kind of crop that they power their way through pretty nicely. So you can kind of convince yourself that this is a more resistant variety. Um, in my experience, they are not. Uh, what they do is they power their way through, you damage some root laterals, they put out new root laterals because they're vigorous, you know, pretty powerful plants, uh, but they're highly infected. So it, we've had lots of experiences in really, a really nasty hot spot with Fusarium. You put Hazaras in there, well, I'll give you an example, you put a highly susceptible variety like DP744, it'll kill every plant. You put uh, DP340 Pima, which used to be one of the most widely grown ones up here in the north because it was a more determinate Pima, and you'd lose maybe half of the plants and the rest would be stunted, and then hang in there okay. Hazara plants would be this tall, they'd be 100% infected. Every single plant was infected, and so essentially those Hazara plants are a nice spore factory. So all the surviving plants are reproducing the inoculum. And so, for the first few years, as it powers its way through, it's a great choice because it's going to persist better and will have better yields. But eventually, that will catch up. So, um, and then I, I guess one of the, I don't know, does that answer your question? Yeah. Then? At least that on all the Hus areas that we've looked at, we've looked at probably HA195 and then some of the YD varieties and some of the other HAs that have come through in recent years, and they've all been really similar. Terms of that characteristic, so there's a couple newer ones from them that, again, I think also show some promise. But you can really tell, at least from the nice thing with our screening trials is the seed companies give us the stuff. They won't tell us what it is. They don't want us to breed and mess around with it. So it's pretty much a blind test. So we get stuff, and then sometimes we'll hear two or three years later what it actually is. And so it's a we, we tell them if it is a loser or if it looks pretty good. And I've seen much more good stuff out of the seed company experimentals in about the last two years than in the prior 10 years to mine. So and there's lots of good information on the website on resistant varieties or, or, or the ratings. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I do think the uplands, you know, I know that's not what, if you're, if you're a determined a kale grower, um, I know Daytona's done really well for a lot of people up here in yields and performance in these soils um, and some other varieties as well but uh, uh, I do think that you know there are a few years out but they'll, they'll, they're working on upland varieties again because they're such a stalwart thing in all of the other production areas of the U.S. You know, they're, they're concerned about how race forward would do if it got into Texas or Alabama or wherever so I think there's, there's quite a bit of seed company efforts in addition to what you see in but we're still the only state, aren't we? We're the only confirmed state, confirmed. which which yeah. uh, kind of amazes me. But I, I'll be darned if I know. I have I I still you know like Mauricio Yo who works with us with USDA. He he has a pile of clothes and shoes and hats at my house because he comes here from Texas. <laughs> he wears those clothes and he won't wear them back to Texas because he doesn't want anybody to say it was first seen. You know like. His plots in Texas, so uh, we're still a little paranoid about this this pathogen. But uh, again, I'm I'm surprised it hasn't been identified. But no one's identified it yet in other states. Lucky us. Um, okay, I think the only other thing I was going to mention, just uh, real briefly or real real quickly, was the uh, something that Dan and I saw last year. I don't know how many people are on subsurface. Uh, in this area, but uh, it was really striking to me last two years 
and fields that were really high yield potential drift, uh, four bale plus yield numbers. Uh, it's the first time in my experience I've ever seen potassium deficiency in like the Pinochi soils in the Five Points, uh, Cantua Creek, uh, Huron area. And if you look at some of the old extension literature from 40, 50 years ago and all, they basically go along with the idea that you'd never see a potassium deficiency in those soils. And I think what it is, is some of the people that, you know, are horribly dissatisfied anymore with a three bale yield, they've got to have four or five. When you put a little tiny root zone and drip irrigate, you know, I kind of think that, you know, maybe Dan knows, I don't even know what to tell people on a potassium fertilization method for drip for a really super high yield. But I, I think that's going to be a topic, you know, as people switch, uh, we have to revisit some of the fertility management issues because uh, we've, we've got these great big huge deep profile soils that we've been using for years and when you switch to drip and you only use a portion of that you know it sort of changes the picture and I don't have any good answers for it but it's it was interesting to me it's the first time I've ever seen it it, it does beg the question as to how scheduling irrigations might help avoid that situation yeah. and, and yeah, right. where, when you want those deficits and, and uh, right. I mean if you if you're building just a small tight little uh, ball right around that right around that emitter right um, if that's the regime that you've set up for yourself um, certainly the limitation in, in nutrient accessing nutrients unless you're unless you're feeding them through the drip system, yeah. Uh, which potassium you're typically not. That's right. that's that's it. you're setting yourself up for for a situation where you could have a, uh, especially right. with these big big yields. You know, big, yeah. And we they're, they're we talked to Dan Putnam about. about that a little bit too, because the people interested in, in the alfalfa, you know, you're removing a tremendous amount of of, uh, of material off of those fields with these high yield numbers that people are aiming for with SDI alfalfa and. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine that you're going to be able to sustain that.